Shabbat Shalom. Today we're looking at Parsha Toledat. Toledat means generations or descendants. This Parsha begins with a mystery. Why is this Parsha called Toledat? A few weeks ago we read Parshat Noach about the generations of Noach. So why not call this Parsha Yitzchak? We're discussing Yitzchak's descendants. This Parsha begins with another case of challenged fertility. It's interesting, and perhaps we should also see that it is necessary the three out of the four matriarchs had trouble conceiving. Their conception was miraculous. The miraculous conception of Yitzchak in Sarah's old age is accepted by observant Jews, while the miraculous conception of a virgin, Miriam, the mother of Yeshua, is rejected. This too is interesting. In this parasha, we learn that Rivka is having difficulty conceiving, although we know that she was quite young when she married Yitzchak. We know that her barrenness was not really counted until they'd been married for at least 10 years. It's likely at this point that they'd been married for at least 20 years. So she would have been at least 34 and Yitzchak 60 and she had not conceived. Both Rivka and Yitzchak prayed that she would conceive, especially as her conception was clearly as important as Sarah's had been. We're told that God specifically heard Yaakov's fervent prayer in keeping with his promises to Avraham and to Yitzchak, Rivka conceived twins, but her pregnancy was difficult and painful. Hashem also heard Rivka when she asked God why her pregnancy was so difficult. And he revealed to her that the internal suffering she was enduring was a microcosmic prelude to the wider conflict that would rage between the two nations that would come from her womb. Esau was born, and then Yaakov, holding on to, to Esau's heel. As they grew up, Esau became a hunter. He was a man of the physical world. Yaakov instead stayed with his parents. He learned wisdom from his father, and his grandfather, becoming a man of God, a man of the Spirit. We may be reminded of Cayenne and Avel. Tradition has it that on the day of their grandfather, Avraham's funeral, Yaakov was cooking lentils, the traditional mourner's meal. Esau rushed in. He was ravenous from a hard day of hunting. In his hunger and the, the desire that it should be satisfied immediately, he traded his birthright and its concomitant spiritual responsibilities for a bowl of lentils. By this act, he clearly demonstrated his unworthiness to stand in the position of the firstborn. But it must be noted that God's choice had already been made. And his choices are seldom what we expect. Fast forward through Yitzchak's life. When Yitzchak sensed that the end of his life was, was approaching, he summoned his elder son to place upon him the birthright blessings. Obviously, Esau had failed to tell him 
of the earlier transaction, birthright for food. Rivka acting, she believed, on a prophetic command that the blessing must go to Yaakov, arranged for Yaakov to impersonate his brother in, in order to receive the blessing. Following this deception, Esau revealed to his father that Yaakov had actually bought the birthright from him, although his anger suggests that he dishonest, dishonestly expected to receive the birthright despite his earlier decision to dispose of it. Yitzchak then understood that the birthright had been bestowed correctly on Yaakov, and he confirmed the blessings he had given to his younger son. But Esau vowed to kill Yaakov for the theft of his birthright. Before this could happen, another Avil and Kayan in the making. Yaakov was sent to Rivka's brother, Levan, for safety, and also to find a suitable wife from among their family. Esav, at the age of 40, married Judith, the daughter of Biri, the Hittite, and Basimath, the daughter of Elan, the Hittite. We read in Romans 12, 9 through 10, don't let love be a mere outward show. Recoil from what is evil and cling to what is good. Love one another devotedly and with brotherly love and set examples for one another in showing respect. Lack of genuine esteem for one another led to Esau's hatred of Yaakov and Yaakov's attempt to take from Esau what God had already promised would be his. This conflict ended only when the nation of Edom ceased to exist at the time of the Maccabees. And yet some say that blood is thicker than water. Esau was the first twin born to Yitzchak and Rivka. He was raised in a home where knowledge of the one true God given to his parents and grandparents was absolutely central to their family existence and their future success. But he chose to stay away from home for long periods of time with hunting as his primary occupation, enjoying a a sensual, pleasure-driven life, and a wandering existence among the idolatrous people of Canaan. Esau was favored by his father primarily for the succulent red stew he liked to make from the game he killed while hunting. This food, venison, certainly delicious, uh, was very much associated with Esau's sensual lifestyle, to which his father succumbed as he grew older. Yaakov, the second twin, grew to manhood, favored by his mother, possibly because she knew from before his birth that God had chosen him over his brother to receive the birthright usually given to the elder son but also, no doubt, because he was present, available, and involved with the day-to-day -day running of their household. He chose to oversee the flocks and herds, the same occupation as Avel, Moshe, David, and others who've been close to God. This choice of occupation kept him close to home as part of the the family team committed to family goals and separate from the local Canaanites. At home, 
he assimilated the important lessons relating to worship of the one true God, the God of his parents, and his grandparents. But when Yitzhak was dying, he sent for Esau, his firstborn. Tragically for Yitzhak, sensual desires had become more important to him than what he knew about his son's character and what he knew from God. As he sat awaiting death, his thoughts turned not to matters of the spirit, but to the tasty stew that Aesop made when he returned from hunting. The morsels of meat became more important to Yitzchak, more precious to him, than proper judgment of the character of his sons. The deception practiced on Yitzchak by his wife and son was a consequence of Yitzchak's own indifference to God's direction, even before his son's birth, and of Rivka's desire to see that the right son got the birthright, taking matters into her own hands instead of leaving them to God, much as Avraham and Sarah sought to produce a son through human means. It also speaks of Esau's greed and disdain for that which was truly to be treasured, and of Yaakov's desire to have what he believed was rightfully his. There was no love lost between these brothers, Esau and Yaakov, despite, despite the fact that they were twins. It's unlikely they'd ever had much in common or had been particularly close. But suddenly, all of the animosity Esau must have felt for Yaakov, which surely had been building up, bubbling up below the surface, burst forth in his desire, his evil inclination fed by Hasatan, to murder his brother. Realizing, perhaps too late, that they had not acted wisely or in accordance with God's plan concerning their sons, Rivka and Yitzchak united to send Yaakov away in order to keep him from harm. But this was also part of God's plan for Yaakov's future. As for the relationship between the twins, even years later, when Yaakov returned to Canaan and made every possible concession to his brother, he could never really fully trust Esau. By that time, it was obvious that Esau had clearly turned away from the God of their parents and grandparents, going the way of his wives and their families, who did not honor or worship the one true God. What do the scriptures say about true brotherly love? And what does that really mean? Wikipedia says brotherly love in the biblical sense is an extension of the natural affection associated with near kin toward the greater community of believers that goes beyond the mere duty in Leviticus or Vayikra 19.18 to love your neighbor as yourself, and shows itself as unfeigned love from a pure heart that extends an unconditional hand of friendship, that loves when not loved back, that gives without getting, and looks for the best in others. Looking at Vayikra 19, verse 18, and the commandment, to love your neighbor as yourself, which Rav Yeshua describes as second only to loving Hashem, we ask, what does it mean to love your neighbor as yourself? Far from being nebulous or vague on this subject, as some may think, Bayikra explains it fully. 
And here is how they explain it. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field, nor gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall not glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather every grape of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal, nor deal falsely, nor lie to one another. And you shall not swear by my name falsely, nor shall you profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not cheat your neighbor, nor rob him. The wages of him who is hired shall not remain with you all night until morning. In other words, you should pay someone that you've hired to do work as soon as you can, as soon as possible. In fact, as soon as the work is completed. You shall not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shall fear your God, I am the Lord. You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. For righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go about as a tale-bearer, nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Notice that loving your neighbor, comparable to loving your brother or sister, is demonstrated not in words but in actions. Sharing with the poor and the sojourner, not aliens as some translations say, but those who were permanent residents committed to the laws of Israel, in other words, in the process of becoming converts, Showing compassion, honesty, and justice in our relationships with others. This is part of loving your neighbor. We are commanded to be impartial, to refuse to take part in gossip or slander, holding malice toward no one, and refusing to bear a grudge. We must take care never to put another's life at risk or to take personal vengeance upon another, because vengeance belongs to God. If we have an issue with anyone, we should seek to settle it by going to him or her directly, and not waiting until Yom Kippur to do it. Rav Yaakov calls this the royal law, which has been known by our people down through the ages. Rav Yeshua condensed these thoughts into a simple assessment of the Vayikra commandments, do to others as we would have them do to you. Furthermore, as we read this morning in our Ketuvim B'meshikim portion, Rav Yeshua directs us to evaluate our actions and the actions of others in a different way. We should view the actions of others in the light of how we want to be seen. The way you judge others is how you will be judged. The measure with which you measure others will be used to measure you. Avoid and reject hypocritical attitudes. Humility is the key. These precepts and commandments are based upon the Mishpatim given in Torah, extended right through the Ketuvim Mishakim. Children are commanded to honor parents if they aspire to long life. Parents are directed to train their children in the ways of God using appropriate discipline, correction, and guidance, not behaving inconsistently inconsistently, pardon me, which causes children to rebel. Husbands are commanded to show the same kind of love
for their wives, as Mashiach showed for us when he gave his life on our behalf. Wives accept the authority of their husbands as head of the home because they have ultimate responsibility to God for the family. Sadly, we, the, we see these directives of God rejected from the top down. Husbands fail to place wives and children before themselves, before their own desires, before their own wishes. As a consequence, wives are unable to accept their husband's authority because it's either non-existent or influenced by the evil inclination. Children suffer abuse and neglect and find nothing to honor in the ways of their parents. Extrapolating upon these commandments, we are to apply these principles to treatment of our people and those in our kahila. We have an obligation to seek the good of all within the Jewish community. We who are committed to the fruition of God's eternal plan should pray for the peace of Jerusalem as commanded by God and do all that we can to build up the nation and people of Israel. And in such a time as this, it means supporting Israel in every way possible, even doing something like buying Israeli products makes a difference. We should also seek the reconciliation of our people as a personal priority. Within our synagogue community, applying these principles means that we should exemplify the qualities commanded to us in Torah. We're told in Ivertim 1317, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your lives as people who will have to give an account. So make it a task of joy for them, not one of groaning, for that is no advantage to you. Fellow congregants are Mishpucha, family to whom our love and loyalty should be given, as we read in Yochanan 13, 34. Ultimately, your relationship with God is also an issue. God is always faithful to you. Human friendships, however strong, may be strained through conflict or lost through time or death, especially as we age. God's faithfulness to you is constant, never failing, unconditional. For the Lord your God, it is he who goes with you. He will not fail you nor forsake you. Real family love is described for us in Yochanan Aleph 4.10. Here is what love is. Not that we've loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the kapora, the covering for our sins. Your faithfulness to God is demonstrated by your willingness to obey his commandments, to follow his precepts and his statutes, to seek to, to serve rather than be served, especially within our kahila. Don't love the world or the things of the world. Imitate Yeshua. Live in such a way that your life reflects to others the kind of love he had for us when he gave his life for us. Characteristics of genuine love are stated by Rav Shaul. First, love is not proud, rude, selfish, easily angered, 
or pleased by the sins of others. It's not negative or conditional. Second, love is patient, kind, trusting, hoping, enduring, taking delight in truth, keeping no record of wrongs, always bearing up. Love is positive and unconditional. To us, the sad narrative of Yaakov and Esau should be a negative reminder of the kind of love we should exemplify. We must be willing to be tried and found faithful, not only to our human friends, which God requires of us, but to the Eternal One, who has already proved himself faithful to us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Shaul says, I may speak in the tongues of men and even angels, but if I lack love, I have become merely blaring brass or a clanging cymbal. Is blood thicker than water? Rav Yeshua said, Whoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Rav Yeshua moved beyond strictly natural relationships and encourages us to embrace relationships which transcend our genetics. Perhaps these words of Yeshua were painful to his physical family, already struggling to understand him, but they were not intended to belittle the relationship between himself and his physical mother or siblings. Instead, he is magnifying the relationship that, that occupies a spiritual plane. These words spoken by Rabbi Yeshua were liberating and joyous to many of his hearers who felt pushed aside by the religious elite and disenfranchised by the social structure of their day. Rav Yeshua was promising that his family, his mishpacha, would be determined by obedience to God, not by blood or genealogy, not by politics, not by power, and not by money. He speaks of those who are closer than our own physical family, closer than physical brothers and sisters. Our true mishpucha is the family of God. God is our Father, and those who worship Him, the one true God of Israel, in spirit and in truth, are members of our extended family, stretching beyond the relationship between Esau, Esau and, and Yaakov, words cannot express what it means to have God as our eternal father. Not a father like Yitzchak, who played favorites, nor a father like King Shaul, whose heart was evil and who turned against those who loved and honored him, even in his own family. Our eternal home is with Hashem. And as we continue our journey to that city not built with human hands, we trust that God has made his home with us here and now. As Rav Yeshua said, God is the father of all who do his will, who follow his commandments. Our true brothers and sisters are those who are the children of God. And our obligation is to love, respect, and honor them as God loves us. Please continue to pray for the nation and people of Israel, not only in the land, but everywhere, as clearly we are under attack, but God is with us.
He is our strength and our might, our power, our strong tower, our guard and our guide. We look to him and only to him. Shabbat Shalom.